is Kate Foley. I am currently a senior at Hobart and Lancet Colleges, and for about the entirety of 2019, I did a research, uh, research project on the lay surgeon, specifically looking at the competition for food resources between uh, the lay surgeon and the invasive brown goby, a relatively new invader to the Finger Lakes region. Um, so first, just to cover some basic background, so the lake surgeon is called the living dinosaur of the fish world. Um, it's up to 100 million years old, it's all their fossils have been dated back. Um, but between the 1800s and the 1900s, they went through a sharp population decline, and this was for a couple reasons. So first, um, farm, uh, sorry, fishermen saw these people, uh, saw these fish as nuisances. So they would pull up these 150 pound fish in their nets, and they wouldn't want them, so they'd throw them on a shore to suffocate. Uh, but later in their lives, they were found their fish were viewed as a delicacy, as caviar. And their meat had high oil content, so they were also used <coughs> as possible fuel resources for um, fit, uh, boats and other type of motor vehicles. Um, so because of this population, they couldn't sustain um, they couldn't sustain what they had left, and this was for a couple of reasons. So first, they had a late sexual maturity. So males don't become sexually mature um, until the age is about 12 to 15, and females between the range of 18 to 27. Um, and paired with this, they have the regular spawning season. So males spawn just about every one to three years, and females spawn every, like, between four to nine. Um, so this can kind of cause for a different kind of overlap and maybe not the most efficient way to uh, reproduce. So looking at the specific qualities of this fish, so habitat. So juveniles typically prefer a softer substrate, so something with a little bit deep water with sand or gravel. Um, and because of this kind of uh, habitat isn't always common in these water bodies, it causes intraspecific competition between them, um, which will kind of become important and we'll loop back to later in the presentation. Um, well, when they become adults, they prefer a little bit of relatively shallow water um, with high density of different kinds of invertebrates. Um, so speaking of feeding, they are benthic feeders. You can see on the side those uh, four barbells that come down from the bottom of the mouth. Um, they use these sensory structures to detect food. And between the, uh, throughout their lives, they have a dietary shift from juveniles to adulthood. So as juveniles, they prefer um, prey items that are a little bit more accessible with uh, maybe a, less of a hard exoskeleton. Um, so something like an amphipod or chronomid. While later in their lives, they go for a bit higher um, energy content in prey, so possibly a muscle. So in New York, uh, their current status is threatened, and New York DEC put out a restoration plan. Um, their goal is to establish a, and maintain a self-sufficient population of lake surgeon. They're doing this through a couple of ways, so through habitat improvement, monitoring, and restocking efforts. And uh, most recently, 2,000 juveniles were released into the Genesee River in October 2019, which is pretty exciting. Um, so on the map on the side here, you can see that the green is where the lake surgeon uh, currently are found, and the red is where they previously were found but are no longer there. Um, so what can cause kind of this uh, what can contribute, sorry, this population decline. And so I'm looking at this invader. So the round goby is relatively new. It came into, uh, to the Black and, from the Black and Caspian Sea region through uh, blast water into the Great Lakes and it was first found in 1990 in the St. Clair River. Um, these fish are kind of pests for a couple of reasons. They reproduce rapidly. So they can reproduce every two to three weeks between the months of April to September. And they're also known to have really aggressive tendencies towards other fish. Um, so to outcompete habitat and resources, which can be problematic. Um, so again, some concerns about the brown goby. So first, their diet overlap. Um, as I said before, juvenile lake surgeon go through a dietary shift. And so this study is kind of looking at the juvenile lake surgeon and the brown goby. So with this diet overlap, the benthic um, invertebrates that might be common to uh, uh, both these fish are mussels, amphipods, and snails, um, which is kind of where this study is headed. So they also are seen to predate on game fish eggs. So more likely lake trout, but also in lower concentrations, they have been seen to eat lake surgeon eggs as well. So this is a map um, created by USGS. So the bigger, the, this is uh, based on ground goby population. So the bigger the circle is the more uh, reports of this fish. So the first is up in the St. Lawrence River, where um, actually, Dr. Don Dittman was able to get the eggs um, for my lake surgeon that I used in my trials, um, and the brown goby was seen there um, up in the 90s. Uh, the second uh, arrow is 
pointing towards Kiwa Lake, which is a neighboring lake um, to our school on Seneca. And that is where I not only released the juvenile lake surgeon after my trial, but I also collected the round will be from that exact lake as well. Um, and the third is up in the Genesee River, where I just said that 2,000 were released in October 2019, and the brown goby has been reported there in a high uh, concentration. So what are my research goals? So first, I was looking to determine change in, um, in uh, consumption levels and prey selectivity by the juvenile lake surgeon when faced with three different treatment types. So I typically, I looked at the no competition, which it was just a lake surgeon, the interspecific competition, where it was a lake surgeon and a brown goby in one tank, and the intraspecific competition where you had two lake surgeon and one tank. Um, I also was looking to see if there's a diet overlap between these fish species. And this kind of target was because I wanted to see if this new invader could possibly um, affect the establishment of the juvenile uh, half and race surgeon. So what are my hypotheses? So first, lake surgeon consumption will increase in the presence of the round goby due to limited prey resources and also that feeling of kind of competition of a different um, species. And also that lake surgeon consumption will be lowest during intraspecific competition. Um, so just as a quick diagram, so inter will be bigger and, um, or sorry, will be higher than the you know and intra le uh, levels of competition, which I would view would be kind of equal. Um, and then the last will be lake surgeon gape size will lead to a consumption of various prey species. So how am I gonna do this? So first, I need some fish. So to get the round goby, we say that in Cuba Lake. Um, the juvenile lake surgeon were generously given to us by Dr. Von Dimmen. They were uh, raised in Tucson Cortland Lab. Um, they were a year old when I got them, and the eggs were taken from the St. Lawrence River, and they were raised <coughs> on a bloodborne diet. Um, benthic invertebrates were taken from Seneca Lake using minnow traps, and also by wading into the littoral zone of Seneca Lake, especially for the mussels, to kind of get those out at a higher concentration. Um, and these later were separated into Tupperware containers um, for experimentation. So what was my setup? So um, you can see that I used two tanks for the round goby for no competition. I used two tanks for just lake surgeon um, for also no competition. Six tanks, sorry, six, um, for the interspecific. So with one round goby and one lake surgeon in them, and then six tanks um, for the lake surgeon and lake surgeon testing that intraspecific competition. Um, this trial ran from 5 p.m. to 8 a.m. in the morning, um, and it was ran twice. So after it was done, what did I do? So first, because the juvenile lake surgeon are vulnerable species, we gastric lavage them so that they could be um, preserved, but the round goby, sadly, does not have that same status, so they were uh, killed and uh, used later for stomach con uh, dissection. Um, the water left in the tanks was filtered out, and those prey uh, were counted in lab, and also the stomach contents of both the lake surgeon and the round goby were then analyzed. So what did I find? So first, looking at a general picture, um, when looking at the no competition type, um, you can see that they had a similar level of consumption than the interspecific competition. But you also see that that interspecific competition has a wider uh, has a wider variety or a kind of a uh, there's different t things that are affecting that in that uh, specific competition. While the intraspecific competition does seem to be a bit lower, but none of these um, are st <coughs> statistically significant from one another. So I kind of wanted to look deeper into kind of specific prey items themselves. So in this trial, I used um, 10 amphipods, 10 bifini snails, and 10 justinia mussels. Um, and so looking at the, so the first thing when looking at these three graphs is that it's apparent that the amphipods were the most preferred prey item across all competition types. So um, the one thing that does kind of stick out here is in the interspecific competition, you are looking at a small consumption of snails. Um, while in the no competition and in the intraspecific competition, there was almost no consumption of snail or mussels and only of amphipods. Um, in all trials, just about every amphipod was consumed, which was pretty significant, and I think there's a couple reasons for why that is. Um, one of which is gonna be their gait limitation, so both these fish are gait-limited feeders. Um, and looking at the gait of the round goby and the lake surgeon, you can see that their gait is pretty slow.
small compared to the Neutrophilia mussels, which I put in the tank in those measurements that I took. While the snails and the amphipods were a bit more in their range, so they are more able to consume them and maybe more attractive to them in these kind of competition types, especially if they're fighting for food uh, for, against each other. Uh, so right now you're going to watch the lake surgeon, um, and he's going to pick up a snail, and he's going to end up spitting it back out. So although there wasn't really a consumption here, it does show that this lake surgeon is able to acknowledge that this is a prey option, um, which means that maybe it wasn't that they didn't want to eat it, but it could have been a different factor. Um, and on the other hand, you're going to watch the round goby in the front here, eat up an amphipod, no problem at all. So when looking at stomach contents, I found proof of amphipods in both uh, of stomach contents, but in two different ways. So in the round goby, there's a bit more of like a, there's more content to it. Um, while in the lake surgeon stomach contents, it was a lot of the exoskeletons. And also those antennae were also found often, so it kind of proves that they definitely ate those. Um, and as I said, in the inter-specific competition types, there was more consumption of snails. But in this kind of uh, competition, I categorize consumption of snails by the gripping of the operculum and the consumption of the operculum. So it wasn't often that the actual muscle tissue of the snail was taken out of the shell, but it was found that every operculum that was removed from the snails was found in a round goby stomach and never in a lake surgeon stomach. So basically, because of the way that this trial ran and the length that it was, the fish digested a lot of what they ate. So although I did get some stomach contents back and some, uh, and was able to dissect fish stomachs, it wasn't, I didn't get the kind of the data I was looking for. Um, but because of this, I kind of looked to literature. So what did I, so it was seen that amphipods uh, can compose up to 80 to 93% of juvenile lake surgeon stomachs, while snails can also uh, compose 33%. Meaning that these fish do eat these kind of prey species in the wild, but maybe in this competition type there were other factors that weren't really um, kind of the same. So, on the other hand, round goby have been seen to average two to four amphipods per stomach, um, which is pretty significant if you're pulling in almost every round goby you have has at least one amphipod in it, which is pretty interesting. And so in the summer of 2018, um, I ran similar feeding trials um, but strictly looking at round goby eco uh, feeding ecology, and it was seen that round goby consumed every single one of these prey types, um, but although similar to this trial, the mussel was the least common. Um, and also in the summer of 2018, it was seen that the round goby did end up sucking that snail tissue out of that uh, shell, which was really interesting, but was not seen in these trials. So there was a prey preference short shown by both fish towards amphipods. This could be because of no outer casing, less energy to consume them, which is really important for juveniles as they're still trying to, still trying to grow, um, and also because of higher mobility. So the snails and the mussels aren't moving a lot, while the amphipods are constantly moving around the tank, and maybe we're no, more noticeable than these fish. Um, the gait limitation of these fish was also something I talked about, and I think probably determined their prey preference. Um, and the lake surgeon limiting the foraging of the round booby was also something that was uh, noticed. So going back to my hypotheses, Number one, the lake surgeon consumption will increase in the presence of the round goby due to limited prey resources. Not necessarily true. Um, you can see that the inter-specific and the no competition were pretty similar to one another. Um, number two, lake surgeon consumption will be lowest during intra-specific, which is kind of true, which is we did see that in that first graph, although it was not statistically significant. And number three, lake surgeon gate size will lead to a consumption of various prey species. Um, and that also is not necessarily true in these trials. So what's next? Um, so taking this research, um, I would like to look at the further interactions uh, between these fish. So first, look at the diet studies, um, maybe with more prey variety, and also change the size of the prey. So make it everything more accessible to them. Um, while also changing the timelines, so I'm able to get those stomach contents that I'm looking for, and able to actually determine what fish ate what. Um, another thing that I've been wondering is when did the lake surgeon begin to eat the round goby? And that's, I'm looking at the size on both of those ends. Um, and then also, if what I found in this uh, experiment is accurate to what happened in the wild, and these juvenile lake surgeons are being released back into the water, it'll be important to establish and sustain that amphipod population so that these two fish species have a uh, continuous food source. And so, 
just to thank the HO General Department and the Provost Office for funding uh, my Honors Committee examiners, um, Dr. Don Dittman, her team at USGS for, for all their help with gastric lavaging and a leg surgeon, um, Genora, Trevor Nazi, Kevin Colton, my uh, research team, Mackenzie Frazier, Ali Seminar, and Cliff Corio, Professor Megan Brown, and Professor Susan Cushman. And that's all. Thank you.